Hello and welcome to Improving Scottish Football. My name is Kieran, and the episode today I'm really excited to be sharing with you guys. You'll hear me say it a lot in the episode itself, but I learn a lot from today's guest, and in many ways it's helped me reshape a lot of my thinking when it comes to Scottish football, so I'm sure you guys will enjoy it as well. My guest is financial expert James Daly. He is a Celtic fan. He's on loan from a data and analytics podcast called The Huddle Breakdown. But don't worry, this is not a Celtic podcast. This is for everyone in Scottish football. James is going to talk to us about the economic realities that hamper Scottish football and how we can potentially overcome the crap hand that we've been dealt financially. We'll also dive into what Red Bull Salzburg and Azed Alkmaar are doing with analytics and advanced technologies. And we're also going to talk about Celtic and Rangers and how they can potentially compete at Champions League level once again. Please continue to support this podcast any way you can, whether it's by liking, sharing, subscribing or leaving us a nice review. Let's keep this going. Let's improve Scottish football. Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the podcast. Today I'm delighted to be joined by James Daly. James, how are you? I'm well, thanks. You are scraping the bottom of the barrel, apparently. This podcast hasn't been out long enough for you to be getting down to the, on the list like this, so but, but thank you for having me. <laughs> oh, well, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you. And, um, well, why don't you start out by giving us a little bit of an introduction uh, to yourself for those who don't know you. Sure. So, uh, first of all, I know it might be difficult to ascertain from my accent, but um, I live in uh, the United States. Um, My connection to Scottish football um, came later in life, uh, practically speaking, but genetically it was immediate. Uh, My mother's from um, uh, Clyde Bank, Lynn Bale uh, area. Um, I grew up with uh, Kenny DeGleish Pennant above my bed. Um, that my grandfather had given me on one of the couple of times, the only time I met him, but one of, uh, one of the couple of trips that I made as a child um, to Scotland to see family. Uh, but it wasn't until my uncle, my, my mother's brother, who started visiting the United States, he was the first relative to really visit um, in the late 90s. And uh, he, he started to come annually. And, uh, over, and I was an adult by then. So over many, many beers, um, we would talk about all kinds of things, and I, I just really loved it because I got to know him really well. And um, so that led to Celtic because he's, you know, and that, my family's huge Celtic supporters. Uh, the data part and analytics stuff, and I, I'm part of a analytics podcast called The Huddle Breakdown, uh, really began in 2019. Um, and that's my background professionally is in um financial markets, business cycles, economics, and uh, associated analytics. There's not too much I'm interested in life, and, and sports is one of, the, one of the big areas, and analytics is one of the others. So put those together, and that's that's how I'm here. Very good. Very good. So obviously the emergence of analytics and data has become huge in football, but probably overall it's fair to say that Scottish football generally hasn't fully embraced that side of the game, I think, you know, especially when you compare us to other countries. I think I'd quite like to start out by getting you to give us a bit of an overview of Scottish football and how it compares to other nations in Europe, other leagues, and where we kind of sit. Because the problem with us who actually live in Scotland is we sometimes just lose the ability to be objective about it. And sometimes it is nice to have these voices from abroad who still know what's going on, but are able to look a little bit more objectively at how we currently compare. I'd say that, well, a lot of it isn't um, probably going to be new to to your listeners, but... um... You know, there, there's starting with the Champions League um, introduction and the exponential rise in related media rights. Um, you've had what was a more, um, you know, call, called a, a middle and, and mass affluent class of, of nation leagues back in the early aughts, you know, back uh, 
you know, as a Celtic supporter, you know, the, the Larson era, um, where, you know, the resources were still at a level where uh, Scotland was in the neighborhood, at least Celtic and Rangers. Um, and if you look at revenues to uh, the big five leagues in particular, they've just detached. And then recently with the English Premier League, they've even now um, and, and, and the, these dynamics are not unique to sports, by the way, this is, we, we're, we're going into the, uh, we won't get into all of this, but again, this goes back to where my actual professional, um, time is spent, but, you know, we're, we're, we're more into a kleptocratic, uh, feudal system that's emerged in the last 25 years in the West in particular, we're almost circling back in time. And so sports is. You know, kind of. I, I, sorry, James. You're yeah. going to have to explain what those words mean to me. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So yeah. So kleptocratic. So basically, post World War II, uh, you had the growth, a lot of growth, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, it really even before that with the Industrial Revolution. So the West enjoyed this really great period of growth that was broadly based, where living standards went up, standard of livings went up for working class people, middle class people, and then you know, kind of in the 70s, uh, that started to detach and you started to get stagnation or even declining. Um, but you had a lot of movement in the workforce, particularly women coming into the workforce. So anyway, the, what kleptocratic, kleptoc kleptocracy is, is instead of that pie growing and everyone kind of benefiting, obviously, depending on the economic system, you know, Sweden's different than the United States. So how all those resources are distributed is different, but the pie was growing. Klepto kleptocracy is when the, the pie stops growing. Um, and actually, most of human history is about kleptocracy, where there's fighting over limited resources. So instead of a growing pie, you have a shrinking pie and fighting to recarve the shrinking pie. So you see that within the context of sports. Um, and you're seeing it in corporate, government, like the move towards big companies basically being subsidiaries of governments or vice versa. Um, you know, uh, companies getting to be just outrageous sizes, that kind of stuff. So that everything's kind of floating to the top and that's this feudalism and the fight between those, uh, entities is what the kleptocracy is all about. Meanwhile, the, most people kind of get left behind and that's within the context of football, European football or global football. You, you're seeing that manifest as well. And Scotland's kind of like a working class, you know, person, uh, in, in the context of, of the, the footballing sport uh, industry. Um, and, you know, the, the, the attempt to go towards a Super League and you even see, you know, the English Premier League is kind of a pseudo Super League at this point. Um, that, that's kind of the, the direction of travel, as some people would say, um, and particularly in the last 25 years broadly. And, you know, um, the mechanism for this has been the media money that that's the tv money and the champions league money and you know part of what happens when you get these dynamics is the big people the big entities try to create a moat around themselves as part of that kleptocracy and the feudalism uh to prevent real competition and um you know whether you see that in big tech companies or you know they, they use regulators and um all kinds of different ways of political influence uh, and governance in order to basically protect themselves. And again, you're seeing that in the restructuring of the Champions League. And, you know, they, they pretend to throw, you know, things that, out for uh, the little people, so to speak. But if you really look at what they're doing, it's consolidating power and, you know, to the benefit. So that's, that's the broader picture. And I, I think that's, uh, I, I, that, that that's also, I think, why it's too much to be too tough on Scottish football, for example. I mean, this, this has been a really tough um, backdrop. I'd, I'd say that even within that context, it's been pretty poor. <laughs> on, on a, <laughs> you know, on an absolute basis, I, I think it's not to, to the it, they've had a tough hand to play, so to speak. And then on a relative basis compared to other similarly sized leagues is where I think you get into, you know, um, where there's, I think, reasonable area for, for criticism. Well, that is very interesting. I feel like I've already learned uh, quite a lot. Um, 
to be honest, a decline in Scottish football in the last 15 years or so. I, probably like a lot of fans, have probably been putting that blame pretty much at Scottish football's door themselves. But what you're actually saying is that there are wider economic societal systems in play that are actually hampering our ability to to compete. Is this system, is this basically the way it's going to go now? Is it just going to carry on in this fashion where England is going to continue pulling away and the bigger leagues? Is there any way of us trying to reverse this? I suspect it is likely to continue. I think the question becomes like who the relative winners are on in the kleptocratic class. Right. So what, what, and you see that, like what, that was what the champions or not the champions, like the, uh, the super league attempt was about. So if you put it through the lens of what I just described, um, you know, the Juventus, Real Madrid, um, Barcelona, you know, piece of that movement was about trying to, you know, look for their slice of the pie, which, you know, Bar- they all see what's going on with the English Premier League, obviously. Um, so for them to be able to compete, which they're increasingly unable to do financially. So that that move towards a Super League was, I would argue, a, um, a kleptocratic power move uh, in the shrinking kind of pie, so to speak. Things are moving, continue to accelerate and funneling higher into just a smaller group of of um of entities in, in industries again all over and and football is just uh, part of that so i th- this is where my criticism um or you know I, I i call it more constructive criticism analysis has been more so that given these really difficult hand that's been dealt the response to that has been you know, lacking. I mean, even within the context of, you know, you get you get dealt seven two offsuit to use a poker analogy. Um, you know, there are ways to play a seven two offsuit. If depending on the situation, what's your stack size? What you know, how many people are at the table? Like you can still optimize a bad hand and be smart about it. And, and you know, bluffing when there's eight people at the table is just dumb. Uh, um, and, and so there's, you know, there's ways to go about being smarter and I don't, for a lot of reasons, um, you know, I don't think it's been going in that direction. Whereas you see, you know, there's an article this week, I think it was in the athletic or last week about Sweden and what Sweden's doing, uh, and how they kind of restructured and renewed their entire kind of club system. Yeah. I read that article. This is where they were. They basically just decided to make it all about the fans right and the fan experience and the the big difference there is that they had a significant deterioration in attendance and that's this goes back to you know market dynamics which is with scotland's um habit of attendance meaning that it's a lifestyle for so many people in scotland it, it's it's the, the best uh analogy we have in the united states i think is college football american football where you just have a like a cultural dynamic and almost a re- religiousosity, if I can say that, I, I didn't say that right, but um, of of going to games and you have such a dedicated fan base up and down the pyramid um, that there hasn't been a lot of um, market forces to drive clubs to improve fan experience. What I've talked about on our podcast and within the context of Celtic is that one of the challenges you see across sports as these in the last 20 years, you've had this kind of revolution in data and analytics. And quite frankly, you know, people getting smarter as a result of that and how they're running things is you get a copycat impulse that occurs, meaning that, you know, you see somebody that's doing it well and you say, let's do that. You know, within the conversation it's with Celtic, people say, well, we should be more like Salzburg or let's follow what Salzburg is doing or Oz at Alkmaar. Um, some of these really, or Bodo Glimt, you know, some of these very interesting dynamic um, clubs that have been out, you know, punching above their weight, so to speak, um, and particularly in Europe uh, over time. And that's, you know, copycatting historically has not worked. <laughs> and um, uh, so, you know, we, so I don't think Scotland should be copying 
Sweden necessarily. Uh, it's more so, you know, how does how do smart people use the tools available and try to innovate and adjust given the challenges that are very specific and unique to the market. Mm. Okay, so we shouldn't be necessarily trying to copy these other clubs, but surely it must be a good thing to at least look at what they're doing and try and and try and learn because again this is a big thing with Scottish football is so many clubs just seem to be so focused on the domestic front and and so few of them seemingly look outside and see what the likes of AZ, Bodo Glimpt, Molde, Midgieland, what these other clubs are actually doing. Are you talking about not copying it as in wholesale take it and implement it yeah yeah i think it more more so from a you know um i'll give you an example particularly with oz and and salzburg too that i've looked at quite a bit i mean they're they're so far out in front um what again kind of going back to in um business training uh industry development tends to go through what they call an s curve um so you know it's, it's the way industries mature kind of from an early stage and they get mature and then, you know, it's how innovation tends to play out. Uh, so those, those are clubs that are way out in front. I mean, they're, they're using things like machine learning, um, and, and, um, uh, virtual reality in order to, uh, address cognitive development of teenagers. So if you really look at the model of what Salzburg's doing, they're, tr- they're recruiting 16, 17, 18 year olds. And again, this goes back to understanding actual human development, both physical and cognitive. So uh, particularly men, if we're talking about the male game, uh, men physically tend to mature and be in their peak physical condition between ages 22 and 25. Um, but the human brain doesn't stop developing for the most part until kind of 25. So that's why historically in kind of a normal sense, um, players peak years would be in their late twenties because they have that blend of, they're still close to their peak physically and mentally they've got that wisdom. They've, they've fully matured, their brains fully matured. And so they're at that kind of nice, you know, cross section and scatter plot, so to speak. And what a Salzburg and Azad Alkmaar are doing is they're trying to say, okay, by the time these guys are 21, what just as they're getting to their physical peak, we're going to use all this advanced technology and information and cognitive, you know, training in order to get these guys' brains way ahead, so that their pattern recognition and their ability to make decisions and do all this stuff that you need to do from a spatial and and um, you know decision making perspective within the game is that of a, you know, in the old days of a 28 year old or a 27 year old. Um, so how they're doing that is intellectual property. Like you just don't, you know, you sure you can buy the software, you can, you know, maybe get the data, but you're not going to get their data that they've been building for the last 10 years or five years or whatever it is. So there's a whole that, that and that's why they're in the front of the S curve. <laughs> and then you have people that come next that try to innovate and progress and this has been my um my criticism of celtic in particular as a celtic supporter is you know they've been at the ass end of the s curve in my Hmm. i i I think scotland in general but celtic as far as you know within the european landscape um has been you know quite late and and the problem with that is the later you are the harder it is to catch up um, because these things, even you, you, you see what's going on with Salzburg now, what things that they were capitalizing on in market inefficiencies, uh, particularly with recruitment in Africa and some of these other markets, people understandably are saying, hey, that's a good idea. Why don't we try that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so what, what, when they were a first mover advantage in some of these things, now that's getting crimped. And, and as the industry kind of starts to catch up, some of those low hanging fruit um are not there anymore so it's a constant hamster wheel of you know innovation and trying to keep ahead of the competition um and that comes down to not only as one of the things i've said over and over again is 
you know, people talk about stats and data and, and analytics, but it really does come down to people. Um, you have to have the talented people in the positions of power uh, to be able to drive culture, drive innovation, and to be smart um, in, in, within the, the modern context and understand these, these industry dynamics. And again, that, that's, that's the hardest part. You, know, you can buy high quality data, you can buy software. Um, I, I think it's on that human capital side that's been much more difficult. And I, I'll share a quote and, and it, it's not a specific quote, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but um, there's, there's a guy named Luke Bourne who uh, is a data scientist and a statistician um, of some prominence in the industry, in the sporting industry, and he's taught at Harvard, right? So we're talking about some significant intellectual firepower. He was on a panel and they were talking about staffing people in analytics in the football industry. Um, and the guy who runs, Knudsen, who runs uh, StatsBomb, founded StatsBomb, which is a big data and analytics provider in, in uh, football, um, asked this question about, you know, how do you attract talent? And what Bourne's answer was, and now this is Bourne, he, he ran analytics at the Sacramento Kings for a period of time in the NBA, and he worked at Roma in, in Syria. So he, again, cross sports, he's got, to your point, kind of a global perspective on this. Uh, and he said that uh, he he recommends that, that clubs hire outside of the industry, meaning that do not hire people from the football industry. And uh, and the reason he said that is that there is an overwhelming irrationality within the culture of football. Uh, and, and again, I I go back to the reason for that is because it's such an innate part of people's existence, um, particularly in you know, markets where it's the focal point from a sporting perspective, which is most of the world, obviously. Um, and, and so it's very emotional and, and, and about ourselves and, you know, uh, um, tribalism and all this, you know, politics, it gets wrapped up into this whole thing. And to try and impose objectivity and analytics onto that, is very difficult from a culture perspective. That's why football, I think, has lagged some other sports um, in adoption and utilization of um, of, of, of some of the stuff. And I, 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 real quick, I'll give another example that I think is fascinating is Barnsley. I don't know if you're familiar with the journey that Barnsley went on, but they're, they're owned by one of these kind of multi, you know, like an American private equity group um, that owned clubs across different European leagues. Um, and they came up with a very specific style of play that most people would consider, you know, an eyesore. It's basically playing long ball. And John Muller, who's an American journalist, actually coined it sky ball in, a, in an article he wrote uh, a couple years back when they were competing, almost got out of the championship into the English Premier League as one of the lowest, if not the lowest, wage bills in the championship, playing this horrible style of football. Um, and the reason why it was working is because they were optimizing, they were being very smart about how they signed players, what, how they were using them, and how they were designing their style of play to leverage the players they had on the pitch. Okay. And yes, it was ugly, but it was working. Um, but what they figured out is by doing it this way, no one wants to buy their players mm -hmm. because they look like crap in any other circumstance and there's no one else <laughs> playing this way. Right. So the business model that they had, part of it was, oh, you know, we're going to buy people cheap and we're going to, you know, this is the player trading model. So they aborted this whole way of playing. And then guess what happened? <laughs> they went right down and they've been struck kind of struggling to recalibrate. And, you know, so this is why I would say, even if you're being really smart about these things, the, the industry realities and the market forces are very challenging. James, this is um, absolutely fascinating. Let's get into some actual solutions, uh, if you don't mind. Give us an indication on what we as a whole in Scotland can start to do, whether that's either from the governance side of things or from a Celtic and Rangers point of view or from any of the other smaller clubs. What 
Is it up to each kind of club to try and take ownership and start embracing some of these new ideas? Or does it need some sort of strategic direction from the top? Where do you think we can start to put things right? Yeah, so I, I um, obviously, I, I need to kind of move myself out of the spa- head space of being a Celtic supporter, although I think some of this would also benefit um, Celtic. And again, I, I'll, I'll say again, like this is just my thinking. I, I don't profess to have any specific expertise, um, but I, I think that Celtic and Rangers need to get out of the Scottish League. Um, for the health of all involved. And I know there was the move, the attempt at the Atlantic League under um, Roger Mitchell, and there's been other, you know, kind of flirtations and discussion about that um, at times. And I, I, I don't think it's healthy for the domestic league. I don't think it's healthy for the two clubs. Because if you think about this, one of the ways that, you know, um, smaller club, and I say smaller, outside of those two huge size clubs on a relative basis. So pretty much everyone else have not had to innovate and really have the degree with which market forces would otherwise drive innovation, even in fan experience, that type of thing, because they know at least a couple of times a season, they get all this revenue coming in from ticket sales from uh, the two big Glasgow clubs coming in uh, and the TV money that they get as a residual out of the Europa or Champions League, and you know, kind of their piece of 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 that revenue stream. Um, so that creates, you know, an incentive structure for the status quo, and um, you know, kind of just limping along in this kind of stasis of. Um, and and if you again, you think about it, if if you're uh, uh, one of the Edinburgh clubs or Aberdeen, you know, how much risk are you going to take? knowing that if you do everything right, the likelihood is you're still going to finish third. Mm. Um, so what, what's the incentive structure to um, take risk and innovate and um, to kind of go outside your comfort zone, to bring new kind of thinkers in, that kind of thing. Um, so I, I think that would be how, how and again, I'm not smart enough or know enough to, to, to th- think about how that would take place. What about before this um, scenario were to happen? What can we actually do in the meantime, whether it is, you know, these other clubs, you know, your Hearts, Hibs, Aberdeen, should they start looking at what some of these other clubs in Europe are doing? Yeah, so if I was a club and trying to... um let's just talk about purely football operations. I'm not talking about commercial or fan experience or anything like that, but just on the pitch competition. Um, I, I think there's a, because it's so bad in Scotland, you know, incremental improvements actually pretty easy should be. Um, but if you want to go more on the revolution side, which is make huge advancement, uh, you, you have to change culture. You have, yeah, you, ha- you have to hire people, um, that are not of the legacy culture, um, but also have a degree of um, emotional intelligence, which is probably the most important thing, uh, because again, you're going to have a hostile takeover from a culture perspective. So you're going to hire someone, let's say, who's, I don't know, Dutch, like like Booker did it, they hired it at at Queen's Park. uh, somebody with domain expertise and the ability to have a vision. I, I've been calling it this role, like that of an architect, right? So th- there's almost an anti-intellectualism um, in, in the sport in general. And I would also argue in Scotland, I mean, if, if you look at the clubs that have really pushed forward here, um, they're hiring physicists and they're hiring uh, uh astronomers, uh, they're hiring people that are very, very intelligent, um, have high levels of training in STEM fields of, you know, STEM. Yeah. Uh, um, and know how to build things. Uh, and, and, and that's, you know, you, again, if you go across other sports, that's, 
you know, baseball being the money ball analogy. And, you know, I think most people are familiar with that. If you go through the front office of, I would argue, the most successful baseball franchise from an from a punching above your weight, you know, the, the Azed Alkmar of MLB is the Tampa Rays. Um, and they routinely compete with the New York Yankees. And they're the equivalent of Aberdeen from a resource perspective on a relative basis. And the way they've done it is their front office, quote unquote, their non-baseball people, I mean, that, man, maybe, they, maybe they're maybe they you know, an idiot like me that played in high school or something, but they, they, you know, they didn't play in the minor leagues or they didn't play at MLB for sure, but they you know, went to a good school and they got a really technical degree and they're very smart and they work very hard. They have dozens of these people uh, dedicated to all types of things from human development perspective, from an analytics perspective. Um, you know, they, they hire women. Imagine that having, wow. you know, <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Actually uh, using half of the global, of the population of your country uh, in, in your operations. That's shocking. I know, but uh, how many Scottish football clubs have women employed? One of the main problems we have in generally, this is across um, domains, whether it's kind of the area that I come back, come from financial markets, economics is there's a lot of bad, modeling that takes place with silly assumptions. And one of the biggest silly assumptions is that human beings are rational. Mm. And that's just ridiculous, right? That from an evolutionary psychology perspective, we actually evolved to be irrational because that's how we survive, right? Survival is the key. It's not about being rational. If it, you know, uh, a, a homo sapien 5,000 years ago Here's something rustling in the in the brush. They don't sit there and go, well, there's only a 0.2% chance that that's a, a bear or a lion. And so it'd be irrational for me to sprint my ass away from this because it's probably a squirrel or a raccoon or something like that or a bird, right? You evolved to fight or flight. And we spend, you know, kind of the normal way people think about it. And this comes back to the eye test. You know, people, I use my eyes, right? So this is within the football, and you hear this, these data nerds versus the eye test. Mm -hmm. Well, the eye test people are in the paradigm that we're 90% rational and only 10% irrational. When the reality is we're only rational probably about 10% of the time, and we spend 90% of the time playing tricks with ourselves, trying to make ourselves feel smart, trying to uh, pretend we're rational, convince ourselves we're rational. Um, and what data is about is, and analytics, again, I would say analytics is, is paramount. You, you know, the higher the quality of the data, the better. Data is not perfect. It doesn't measure everything. High quality models, all models are bad. They're all wrong. Some are more useful than others. And what the analytics domain is takes those two things and can draw conclusions of objectivity. Try, how do you get to that point? How do we overcome these human failings that we have um, as, as uh, you know, mammals that evolved and to be irrational? And the only way to do that with a culture, I think, is to value that analytics piece as the base layer and then build on top of that. And I think right now we've got the base layer in the industry, but particularly in, in um, Scottish football, where that value, the value of that is not appropriate. It, it's, we're, they're, they're still valuing the irrational um, over you know, objectivity. So again, I, I'm not pie in the sky, like saying this is all good. There's a lot of complexity and potential negatives that go along with it too. But again, if you're a club that's trying to compete in this world, and if the bottom line is to try and, you know, you have to strike a balance. And I think right now the balance, particularly in Scotland, is skewed way, way too far away from, um, you know, even using it for recruitment, which at this point should be, you know, if you're not doing advanced analytics in player recruitment, I mean, you're, you're basically in the dark ages. Yeah, and in the grand scheme of things, this isn't very expensive, you, you know. The, the the analytics, it's a lot cheaper to do than you know spunking two million pound here, three million pound here on a whole raft of players. Which, to be fair, Celtic have kind of done. 
specifically in the last transfer window, just gone kind of scattergun, a lot of money in lots of different places. Um, and you have to kind of question whether they have done, you know, the proper analytics on these players. So I, I have done it. Oh, great. So I'm, I, I'm confident in saying they have not. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> And so I, I, I do, I've done threads and I've written articles. And so, you know, typically I go through what I call a benchmarking exercise. Again, that's classic analytics benchmarking and smart benchmarking is a huge part of that. Like, how do you know how you're doing unless you compare yourself to something and how do you create the benchmark? That's something that, you know, I've been very critical of Celtic is because of the structural issues in Scotland, the benchmark in Scotland is absurd. Um, it, it, I, I, I've joked, it's like Billy, if I remember the movie, Billy Madison, the Adam Sandler movie. Um, but it's like Adam Sandler being in first grade playing dodgeball and benchmarking himself against first graders and thinking that he's a great do dodgeball player. No, he's an adult playing dodgeball with children. I know that sounds insulting, <laughs> but that on, on a competitive basis with financial resources, disparity, the way it is. It and, and you know, um, Celtic and Rangers have enjoyed that comparable dynamic going into the Champions League the last couple of seasons. So, when you get such a huge disparity in resources, it's you, you sh it does it makes the benchmarking exercise absurd. Uh, so I'm not that critical of Celtic, you know, losing five or six nil to a Barcelona or even an Atletico Madrid. Um, because that happens when you've got resources that crazy on, in a one-off game. Um, so the benchmarking process is how do you, how do you craft a, a, a benchmark that makes sense given the question that you're, you're asking and trying to answer? And, and even within the context of resources, you know, I, I think it, clubs can be smarter um, by doing a more sophisticated analytics. And to your point, so I go back to that, the, the analogy or the example of, of the Tampa Rays, you know, their front office is one of the biggest with a lot of smart people and relative to, you know, their wage bill, quote unquote, it's nothing like th these people all make a good living. But, you know, to hire, let's again, I'm just saying uh, a, a theoretical physicist for 250 grand a year, you know, within the context of of uh, the Glasgow market might be like, holy crap, like that's that's a huge wage for a regular person and all this stuff. And it's like, yeah, but if they're going to help build your entire culture and infrastructure and prevent you from flushing 5 million a year uh, per summer down the toilet, <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a, or, or, you know, five of those people or 10 people at a hundred grand, right? So the scaling of that, you can get a lot of really talented, smart people. And if you empower them for not that much money and the return on investment, is you know pretty crazy actually so yeah the bang for the buck there i think is 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 huge but the problem there is if it doesn't come from leadership if it's not a buy-in this is where i think celtic has a major problem <laughs> um is if if you don't have buy-in from the true power centers at a club to empower people of that ilk like liverpool did with a theoretical physicist um, like Man City has now done uh, with, I think their main guy has a PhD in astrophysics uh, who runs up their analytics department. Um, so, you know, it, 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 unless you have that buy-in, it goes to waste because Barcelona did it, by the way. Barcelona had one of the best and earliest uh, uh, investments to create a, an advanced analytics arm. And then the people running the club would just ignore it and make their decisions anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's probably happening at some clubs too, where you do actually have some smart people that are giving good information and suggestions. And then you have, you know, the products of the legacy culture saying, no, oh, I know better. My eyes are telling me. And Yeah. I mean, there's obviously no doubt that's a huge hurdle in Scottish football because it is just all filled with old white men who, you know, this is the way we've always done it. And obviously there's some significant cultural and historical hurdles there. Um, James, honestly, we could go on for a long, long time. I just want to touch on Celtic and Rangers in the Champions League, because obviously this is, we're fresh off, you know, Celtic getting knocked out 
And obviously Rangers had a brutal season last year as well. There's obviously a lot of conversation about the fact that maybe the Europa League is more the level for Celtic and Rangers. Is that, from your perspective, the right way of thinking about it? Is there any way that Celtic and Rangers can compete in the Champions League competitively like they did in the early 2000s? Or do we just need to kind of accept this whole, um, hang on, what's the word? Kleptocratic. Kleptocratic, yeah. Yeah, kleptocratic. I'm adding this into my vocabulary. Uh, Do we need to accept the kleptocratic kind of economic societal issues? Is there any grounds for optimism or do we just kind of have to accept, you know, certainly in the next few years, the Europa League is more kind of the level that we should be kind of operating at? Yeah, so I, I would say that from a um, a baseline, um, well, first of all, I mean, I just generally trying to be the best version of oneself, I think, is aspirational and, you know, ideal. Um, or at least moving in that direction, whatever best means. And I, I think that's where there's huge room for improvement. Um, so uh, I think that Celtic within that context has a higher hurdle. Um, and that I think is a cultural issue and a style of play issue. Uh, I was very skeptical that as, as terrific of a, a a manager as Ange Postacoglu was and is. Um, he's an ideologue, and I don't mean that in a critical way. I mean, I, I mean that in a, a Bielsa sort of way. I mean, he plays the way he plays, and he's not going to give an inch. Um, and I was, was very skeptical that given Celtic, the, the nature of the dynamics and the, the quality of Celtic's recruitment, that that was going to work in Europe um in in any kind of durable sense particularly at the champions level ch- champions league level so i was very skeptical about that i think rangers because of their style of play and and again obviously celtic pedigree wise and historically tend to have a more attacking front foot culture um and and i think that creates its own very specific challenge scaling up against better competition. I mean, and I think if you look at Atletico Madrid, for example, I think the reason that they have had, they've punched above their weight. I mean, even though relative to Scotland, they had make a ton of money, but within the big five leagues and the Galacticos clubs, they've actually really done well uh, under Simeone's ten, uh, tenure, particularly in tournament football, because of optimizing, playing a counterattacking, very solid defensively. And I think you know, you, you know, if you look at Rangers running Europa League to the final, being beating uh, several clubs of much higher talent levels and financial resources, they were able to do it because they played a more defensive um, counterattack uh, style of play. And they had some really good athletes doing it. You know, Joe Rebo and Glenn Kamara and, um, you know, younger versions of Tavernier and Goldson. And the other big part I would say is that the value of the goalkeeper position, that that's probably the lowest hanging fruit um, in, in the analytics space now where um, I think the culture and the legacy mindset on the goalkeeper position is uh, very antiquated mm-hmm. and that there's a huge competitive advantage that clubs could, could garner by deploying um, more advanced analytics. And there's actually a um, gentleman named John Harrison, again, another STEM guy. I think he's another astronomy uh, uh, person that's been creating his own metrics, his own data, particularly in the, in the Premier League. But um, I think where Celtic, and if you look at attribution, this is another mo- uh, concept that I've tried to extend from my background in analytics in the financial world is how do you attribute performance within the sporting environment, particularly with, with football and Celtic. Um, and if you look at even Celtic's run or Rangers success in Europe, even during this period of, um, as Roger Mitchell has called it, managed decline, and, and I agree with that, uh, is it's been really good shot-stopping keeper play. Because at the Champions League level or against better quality teams, 
you have a keeper that has the ability to have one of those kind of games where instead of three goals being scored, it's zero. Um, and it's not because the overall team wasn't overmatched. It was just they stood on their head for a game. Um, you know, that's a, a huge component to this. So I, I, I don't think um, Celtic have weighted that important enough. Um, and if you look at when they have had success, Fraser Forster in particular in recent history. And again, that doesn't mean that that's always the best optimization for keeper play. I mean, that Ederson at Man City is different than Fraser Forster for Celtic playing in the Champions League. <laughs> um, so the weighting of what the skill set is of the keeper can be, I think, optimized depending on the circumstances of the team and, and the competitive dynamics. Um, so I, I think that they'd have to get really smart, uh, not only in recruitment, um, but kind of optimization of style of play and, and squad utilization uh, in order to, you know, sustainably compete at that level. Could you have, again, this is where you, you look at Bruges, for example, last season, uh, I think his name's Mignolet, had a just a, you know, really great um, shot-stopping group stage. And I think they ended up second and made it to the knockout stages in the Champions League. That's a comparable club to, to Celtic and Rangers. That's, a, that's, you know, when I do my benchmarking exercises within European clubs, that's right in, you know, the, the population of clubs that I look at. So that's an example of the value of, you know, keeper play and how you could, you know, so the way I've talked, I've thought about it and talked about it when we discuss things on our, our podcast is I think, you know, kind of pot four, pot three champions league, obviously that's changing going into next season, but conceptually getting into the Europa league and then being kind of a quarter semifinalist level club in the Europa league. That's the sustainable. I think that's a baseline. Um, that's achievable uh, even without being like insanely great, like being the Tampa Rays of global football. I think uh, with, with smart improvements that would be achievable and realistic. Um, to be honest with you, I haven't updated myself enough on the new Champions League. I know that there's no dropping down to the Europa League anymore. And I know they're changing how pl teams play, the number of, you know, pot four, place pot four, that kind of thing. Throwing scraps to the club in the kleptocratic system. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, I, I think, I mean, that really is. I mean, Celtic and Rangers reasonably are quarterfinal, semifinal Europa League level. And, and that comes down to resources and, and the realities of that. Um, but neither are performing up to that level. And again, I think Celtic, in particular, have an even bigger challenge because of the style of play. And when you get into tournament football, the dynamics are different versus the 38. This is another whole conversation on analytics, which I have some uh, bones to pick even with uh, some some people that have done it very well. For, for example, at the Tampa Rays, um, is how do you optimize for, in baseball, a five-game series or a seven-game series versus 162 games? In football, you've got, you know, uh, we, we Americans would call the regular season, <laughs> the league campaign um, of in Scotland, 38 games versus knockout. Uh, and those are different. Those are different environments. Um, and, and aligning your decisions and how you go about things. If Again, if you're going to try to optimize, uh, the approach would be different. Um, so that's why I think it's tough. It is a more even more difficult hand for Celtic to play within the context of wanting to play attacking style. Mm. Brilliant. Well, that brings us on to the last question, which I ask every guest, James. Um, so if you had a magic wand and you could change one thing about Scottish football, what would it be? Yeah, so I, 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 the one thing I mentioned, which would get, get Rangers and Celtic out of it, um, uh, cause again, I think that would unleash competitive dynamics and, and kind of incentivize the rest of the pyramid, um, to maybe go in directions that are, are currently being hindered. Um, and I don't, I mean, I think some of it is, as I mentioned there's explicit and implicit. I, I think 
Celtic and Rangers for a lot of reasons behave in their own self-interest. I mean, that's what happens. And I think that conflicts with the interests of um, the rest of the pyramid at times. Um, so that, that, that would be the one big thing I, outside of that. I mean, I, I mean, I, again, this, none of this stuff is unique to me. I, I've listened to some of your other podcasts. I mean, I think, um, introducing incentives for youth development and, and whatever that looks like. Um, and, and that, that's a societal issue. That's, that's hard. I mean, that's really hard stuff. That's a, you know, I, I'd sent you, we didn't get a chance to go over, but looking at like the coefficients of national teams. And um, again, this is not unique to Scotland. The one of the ones I sent had like Paraguay and Austria and, you know, kind of Switzerland, like some comparable population countries. Everyone, pick, you know, picks out Croatia because they're the, you know, the one that is doing it insanely well and, and that kind of thing. But um, I, I think that's a, a broader challenge we have societally in the West in particular, as far as youth and helping them stay active. And I mean, I've struggled with my own children and, um, you know, the childhood obesity epidemic and all this other stuff. So it's, there's a lot there. Um, so I, I would say, you know, however we do it, it's not unique to Scotland, but, you know, uh, healthy, active kids that learn how to play the game and have fun doing it. And I think we've lost our way I, I, from what I've heard, and I, I have a couple cousins involved in youth football in Scotland, uh, not as crazy as in the U.S., but, but probably in the unfortunate direction in, in the U.S., you know, kids not playing multiple sports anymore, that kind of stuff. Um, they're, they're dedicated way too young in one sport, um, you know, getting overcoached, not just learning to play. Uh, again, a lot of that's not unique to Scotland, um, but I think that would be the other thing. Brilliant. Well, listen, James, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. You know, I, I genuinely feel like I have learned a lot in um, just the just listening to you there. So um, I will definitely be uh, getting in touch about getting you back on at some point. But um, thanks again. And uh, thank you to everyone who was listening. Thanks, Karen. This podcast was produced by Edinburgh Documentary Films, which is a film and media company co-founded by me, Kieran Hennigan. So we make documentaries for TV and cinema, but we also work with companies and brands to help them tell their stories in impactful and meaningful ways. You can find out more at edinburghdocs.co.uk and please contact me directly if you'd like to talk about any potential projects.